Hi, thank you so much for tuning in to watch ICC's online services. My name is Ravi and I'm the founder of the International Christian Community. Please do stay tuned because right after this message, there's something very important I'd like to share with you. So in the meantime, be blessed and enjoy. The, the message for today is titled Quo Vadis. Uh, um, just simply a Latin expression, I love it, it means which way? Which way are you going? And I'm not talking about us as Christians and those who are not Christians. I'm talking about us as Christians only. Which way do we go? Um, because we live in an age where life and the Christian life cannot just be taken for given. We live in a world of constant change. Look at this. This is me and technology, right? I'm the old generation, and I'm coming to this in just a moment. So we live in a world of constant change. How many years ago did we have the internet for sort of the first time as ordinary people? Do you remember? It is not more than 20 years ago. And back then, it was only for a very, very few people. How many of us have internet connection today? I remember when it took half an hour to upload and download a five megabit or megabyte picture. Half an hour. How much time does it take today? A couple of seconds, right? So things are, are, are changing constantly. Things are moving on. We live in, a, in, a, in an area where we have a wealth of entertainment. If you receive uh, ads in, in your mailbox, like I sometimes do, recently we received this one from, from uh, TDC, I believe it was, where we could order these packages, television packages, 58 channels, 77 channels, or what know I. We have a lot of entertainment on the internet as well. So wherever we go, there's something to consume our time. News, news media is hurled at us 24 seven these days. There is not a place you can go where you don't have a chance to receive news. You go on the local S train, right? What do we have? News on the television screens. Short news, but news nevertheless. When something happens, say in Japan or Australia, we used to be able to get it by telefax, you know, boom, 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 something is happening, we, we got a first report. Nowadays, wow, in seconds, we've got it. The whole thing is up and running. So we live in the brave new world of social media. Young people, social media, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Facebook, what is it called, uh, Snapchat? I don't even know what all of this stuff is called, but we live with it, we breathe it practically, don't we? And what does it do? I mean, I'm a teacher. You wouldn't believe how many students sit there during class. You know, they're not paying attention to the teaching. Social media, right? We need to stay in touch, stay in touch, stay in touch. We, we are in an era where being together geographically is no longer as important as it is to be together in, in time. It's, 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 it's a strange phenomenon, and, and a lot of us older ones, like me, we sort of get upset by this, right? It's like, come on, be together with us when we're here. And even we suffer from it. When, when we are together, you know, I, my fan club down here, right? Uh, when we are together, even we sometimes sit on the media while we are together as four people. We've been influenced by it. Let's see if I can get this. Oh, here comes two. So, we're the first generation where the younger people are teaching us old folks. This one, by the way, right? One of the things. Uh, and we also live in an era of the selfie. Beep, 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 you know. Me, 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 everywhere, right? We post it to the media all the time. Uh, the German sociologist Karl Mannheim, he talks about the era of the narcissistic young generation. Because it's like, it's all about me. Look at me, look at me. I live this life. Look, picture here from this cafe, picture from that cafe, picture from this event, picture from that party. 
That is the world where we as Christians need to navigate. And it's not easy. So many things can steal our attention. So how do we navigate? How do we do it? Let's read from 1 Corinthians. Interestingly enough, this passage talks about, well, not a marathon, but almost. A race, running a race. And I think that's kind of appropriate for today, don't you think so? With a marathon running on on the streets right outside. Um, And this is Paul talking to the Corinthian church about being Christians, about living the Christian life, and not just sort of fooling around. Listen to what he says from, from verse 24. Do you not know that in a race... All the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do, they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating in the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, that goes for me, doesn't it? I myself will not be disqualified for the price. I beat my body and make it a slave. It is important for us to um, see that we cannot just do anything that we'd like to as a Christian. And so what are we to do in, in, in this time? Well, look at it. If we look at this runner who runs the race, what does he do? We, we all want to win something, don't we? We all want to make it to heaven one day, don't we? I think we'd like to. That, that's sort of our goal. I think we can agree on that one. Anyone who oppose? I hope not. So, it says, yet only one can win here. Of course, we can all win because there is a victory for each one of us. God has fortunately prepared that, you know. But it is also important for us to understand that as as competitors, we go into this training. We go in, you know, we need to work on our Christianity. We need to work on our faith to make it relevant in order to be able to navigate through an age like this. If we don't, guess what happens? It's going to be pretty chaotic. Now, I don't know if if you ever do any form of physical education. I'm I'm a bit lazy. I'm at an age where I should be running regularly. It's hard. I don't. (laughs) But if I were to participate in a race, my daughter actually challenged me last year to participate in, in the marathon. So we did that. And I had to go into training. It was necessary, trust me. <laughs> and um, so I had to run with regular intervals. And a person training for something does training with regular intervals. Um, then you will do specific training related to the particular type of sport that you do. A boxer will obviously train his arms more than a runner, and a runner will train his legs more. It it, it makes perfect sense. A swimmer, well, they have to train the entire body. You know, that's probably one of the hardest sports I I can think of. But specific training related to what type of sport I do. I think that is, if we can catch that picture, I think that is important. Then, dieting to consume only the right type of food and drink. Think of it, if I pour down peanut butter, Snickers, Mars bars, guess what? My shape is not gonna be very good. You know, it's too much sugar, it's too much fat, it's too much of the wrong stuff. I get some quick energy, 
but I burn out fast. Not good. So I need to adjust my intake, whatever comes into me, in order to do or to fulfill my place and in order to be able to navigate. What it really means for us as Christians is to separate some of the things that we don't need. And maybe there are some things that we have to say no to. Um, we need to deny the things that defeat our purpose. Now, if, if a runner wants to win the marathon, guess what? He does not go out to party the night before because he's got no energy to run the day after. So he denies himself certain privileges in order to be prepared for what he has to do. That's a quite natural thing. If you jump a trampoline, you know, I was told by a teacher once, because I, I, as a young person, I, I jumped a bit and thought it was kind of fun, um, that my trainer said, you know, the professionals never touch alcohol because alcohol, in, in even the smallest amounts, will influence the balance just a little, little, little bit. But when you hang up there, like five meters above the trampoline, you've got to be straight on the spot with your balance. There's no room for error there, or it goes fatally wrong. So, sometimes there are things we cannot do. Then, of course, we need to develop a system where we have routines of work, of rest, and of sleep in order for the body to have a proper rhythm. That is also part of our Christian life. How, how do we do this as Christians? We need to ask ourselves. We need to find a way, okay? And then the runner or the trainer, the, the person who's fighting to win, constantly pushes his own or her own borders, own limits. When I was young, I, I did athletics, a 100-meter dash, and I was quite fast. I usually won my heat, but there was one guy in the competition, his name was Benjamin. I to this day, I still remember. I mean, we are talking, what, 45 years down the line. I still remember. I never could beat Benjamin. He was one year older than me. And at the competitions, wherever we went, Benjamin always won. In one heat, I got to meet the man himself. I had to run against Benjamin. I ran the fastest I possibly could. He was still just a little bit ahead of me. But see, with the help of Benjamin, I set a personal record that day. I ran faster than I had ever done before. And it took years before I got to the point of running that fast again. So it did help to run straight against him, pushing my limits. All right. So, then, Paul also talks about he cannot run around being aimless. If we're Christians, we cannot be aimless. Guys, running a little bit here, running a little bit there, doing this and doing that, and it doesn't work. If we have no direction as Christians, guess what? We're headed nowhere. Look at this. Look at, look at what happens if we are aimless. And I know I need to hurry up a little bit now. We have no direction. We have no goal. We have no purpose. If we are aimless, we're not headed in any specific direction. That means we are not going for a certain goal, and that diminishes our purpose. So, we end up achieving nothing, and Paul talks about it as living as enemies of the cross. Why does he do that? Because by not having an aim, by not having a goal, we end up doing all sorts of funny things. We, we end up doing whatever comes to us instead of leading our lives. I'll come back to that later. Now, this is a perfect picture of aimlessness, right? Look at it. Hens running around without heads. Bark, 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 bark. In every direction you can possibly think of. Would you like the Christian church to look like this? I think not. I hope not. Well, it doesn't really matter, does it? Yes, it does. Now, let us look at what it means to have an aim and a goal. We need to subdue our bodies, or in our case, our life situation, to the goals that we have. 
Because we do have a goal, you know that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello, church. Do we have a goal? I think so. I hope so. <laughs> so we need to be disciplined. Oh, that is so tough. It's tough for me. I'm an ordinary human being. I may stand up here and preach to you because I was invited to. I'm still a human being. I fight. I fight laziness, guys, just like some of you do. It's not, it's not all that uncommon. But we need to learn to do what must be done instead of just giving in to whatever we would like to do at the moment. Oh, I jump to here. Do not let, st let the, uh, circumstances determine your life. You know, don't just take whatever comes to you. It's a bad road because it leads to this to and fro here and there and, and a little bit of everything and, and, and a whole lot of nothing. It doesn't do us any good. So we need to, as Christians, really, and, I, and I, again, I hope you agree with me, we need to know where we are headed. We need to know our next move. Isn't that right? Are you falling asleep? I hope not. So what it really means is we need, we need to know our calling. And our calling is different from e for each one of us. God has a general calling to every single one of us, of course. But then we also have a specific calling in our lives. Look at this picture. Unfortunately, I don't think you can really see the expression on these little faces. But let me tell you about it. This is a, a photo I took in Germany, in Berlin. You have people marching in rows. They're going uh, with, with a sense of direction, moving arms out, stepping out, you know, good, solid steps. They walk with certainty. If you look at them, heads held high, up. I have a purpose. I'm going somewhere. And there's a satisfaction in these faces. It's like, yes, this is good. I like what I'm doing. I know where I am headed. They go in different directions. Yes, we will do that because we have different callings. But I think, I, to me, this, this would be a beautiful picture of the Christian church because we walk with determination because we know where we are headed. By the way, church, folks, is not the building we're in. It's you and me. So, Philippians 3.12, Pastor Ravi took this passage up, uh, is it about three weeks ago when we had our annual meeting where he talked about Paul uh, describing himself and his race? I want to read that to you again. I, I think it, 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 you can handle hearing it again with only uh, three weeks interval. Or is it four by now? Time runs so fast. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 12 through 14, and then I want to add verse 17, because he says he's saying something very special. And that ought to be an encouragement to all of us. Listen to this. Not that I have already obtained all this, that is, have been made perfectly complete as a Christian, or have already been made perfect, here it comes, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. So Christ called me into a purposeful life, and I want to grab that purpose. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Do we need to read this once again? I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And then comes this verse, verse 17. Listen to this. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. Paul is using himself as an example. And I must admit, sometimes I'm thinking, wow, can I, can I say the same thing? Follow 
my example? Can I say this to my Christian brothers and sisters? Follow my example. What does it require? It requires that I live like a, a person walking in the footsteps of Jesus. That I live like a person walking in the footsteps of Jesus. This is so important. And sometimes we tend to make it difficult, but actually it can be really simple. So, every follower of Jesus has a purpose, a calling, a direction, and a goal. All right? We all have that. No excuse. All of us. Understand what the Lord's will is, Ephesians 5, 17. Understand what the Lord's will is means think about it, pray over it, move into it, walk into it, take steps of faith into it, try it out. Don't just sit back. Now, a little word of warning. We are so easily tempted to sit back and dwell and just wait. Look at these three sentences. I'm praying about what to do. I'm waiting on God to show me. And then the Holy Spirit must guide me. I remember years ago, I talked to a lady. And it was a bit of a strange conversation. She claimed that everything we did as Christians would have to be under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And I can agree with that. But then she said, therefore, we need to sit down and pray about absolutely everything that we do. That sounds good. So should I pray about whether to be uh, a Christian today or not? I don't think I need to pray about it, to be honest. I think it's very given that, yes, I do need to be a Christian today. Should I pray about whether I need to be a testimony of my faith to others today? It's really been given in the Bible already. And so what I want to say with this is don't use this as a, a pillow on which you put your head to rest and just do nothing. You know, these statements are all right and they're all good and they're all beautiful, but they can become an excuse for not moving in faith. Okay? Don't be tempted to do that. Scripture has to already told us what to do, right? Right, folks? Hello! Are you here? Oh, that's much better. Do you know what Scripture has told us to do? What, who remembers the greatest commandment? Ah, love the Lord your God with all the mind, soul, heart, strength, etc., etc., and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself is sometimes the tough part, isn't it? Do we always do it? Maybe not as much as we ought to. There's another one. John 3, 16 to 18. Explain. This is where Jesus talks to Nicodemus, you know. Explain God's plan of salvation to people. You know, whenever there's an open opportunity. Now, I know very well that we cannot do this on a daily basis in our jobs. Because that's not why we were hired by the company. If they hired us to do that, oh, perfect, you know. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Hey, I'm in for it. Give me the job, please. The sooner the better. But, you know, so, so we need to work around that situation. And I, I, want, I would love to have said much, much more on this point. Now, um, at the wedding in Cana, Jesus did not speak one word of the gospel message. Not one single word. But he performed his first, and I believe, very important miracle. He was at a wedding, invited with the other disciples. You know, weddings back in the days, you know, most of the village turned out and to show, you know, they, mo they showed up at, at these weddings because everybody knew everybody in these villages back then. And the groom was responsible to make sure that there was food and wine enough. That 
is costly. And so, of course, you know the story how they run out of wine, and Jesus not just performs this miracle where they have more wine. I mean, this is the Grand Cru, this is the Grand Reserva. It is a very good wine, and, and the person to, to taste it, he was like, wait a minute, normally you put out the expensive wine first, and then when people had a bit to drink, you start giving them the cheaper stuff. You did it the other way around. Of course, the groom didn't know what had happened. But Jesus did good to people. He, wow, here's a situation that could turn into a disaster. Let, let me pour some love on these people. Now, don't go and give everybody wine, because you know, that's not what I'm trying to say, though. Matthew 5, 44 and 45. Love even your enemies. You know, your chemistry does not fit with everyone. It, it's a given fact. We, we do not just get together with every single person on earth. Love them anyway. Amen. Excuse me, is this in, in the imperative? I think so. So it's not a choice. It's not something I can do if I please. It's something I have to do, okay? Go make disciples. Imperative once more. I. Can we get rid of these imperatives? They're so demanding. Well, no. Go make disciples. That was what Jesus told us. Go into all the world. We cannot do this as, a one, as one single person, but we can do it um, if we are more people. All right. Let us try to move on a little bit now. So, waiting on God, resting in God, whatever you call it, really means taking steps to reach out. And some of those steps you'll have to take in faith, not knowing whether it's going to work or not. If we do only what is safe, we wouldn't be doing much. When Lilian was speaking, is it a couple of months back, Lilian? You talked about giving God an opportunity in the sense that if God, if we had it in mind to be a witness to other people, to testify to other people one way or the other, or to be there just to love on people, if we asked God to give us an opportunity, she said he would. Let, let me give you one more little story. And this is not just to brag on myself, but it's a recent story that happened. Some weeks ago, three weeks maybe ago, at our morning table, before we had breakfast, where, you know, I'm usually pretty unconscious, but I, you know, this morning I just felt like, mm, God, use us today. And that was just one sentence in, in our short prayer, really saying grace over our breakfast. You know, I work as a teacher. I, I have a lot of students come in uh, for meetings. They, they study at home. They come in and we have a meeting. I, I evaluate the, the work that they've done, etc., etc. And the very first student that morning, I got a perfect opportunity to just bless that person and encourage that person. I couldn't sit and share Christ, but I could say to this person, listen, you're a person of value. There's, there's a future for you. You know, there's, there's a possibility for beauty ahead in your life. Now, you probably know, you, you need to know that a lot of these students that I work with have dropped out of school because they didn't fit in. Or some of them, they have definitions, ADHD, or they are uh, Asperger's, or, you know, these kind of students. They're students with a lot of defeat in their lives. And so it's all the more important, I think, to, to just be of an encouragement to them. I have students that, well, that used to be my students. They still come back to talk. Because somehow, we connected. Somehow we bridged. And they just like to come back to their old teacher and, and talk with him. They bless me by being that way. So when I give, I also receive. Whoa! Double up, guys. Let's see if I can get next one up. So, let's see. Here we go. Please move. Okay, this is a little experiment. If I spent two years winning one person for Christ, sharing my faith with people, two years, I think that's pretty adequate time. Then that means that in four years, we're going to be two persons who are now Christians, right? And we're working to win two more people. 
Six years down the line, four people have come to Christ. That's not a whole lot. It's pretty slow. Eight, it's a little bit, but still very slow. Okay, now let's push it up. 20 years. Come on. 512. 25 years, 3,072. If we keep doubling every other year. Now, we are not one person in this church. How many are we here today? I think more or less 50. I think my calculation held right. Let's try the next column. Two years to win the first 50 people for Christ. Four years. That makes 100, right? Six years. That's when we're 20 years old. We won 200 people for Christ as a church. Eight years down the line. Now, let's move to 20. Are you ready? Look at the effect. 25,600. 25 years down the line, 153,000. Wow. Guys, that's our job. We cannot be solely responsible for this. Let's move on. But we have a chance to be part of this. In, 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 in 25 years' time, it means that we have reached out, if we were with it from the start, we have reached out to 12 persons only. We're working on number 13, okay? 25 years, 12 people on my part, 12 people on your part. But that adds up to these numbers. So, my main point number three, living with purpose on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, and on Friday. Because that's where our Christianity needs to show itself. It's good that we come to church, but quite frankly, it doesn't bring anyone to Christ. It doesn't show that we're Christians out in the world. And when we look at the first, you know, the first century church, it exploded. Wherever Paul and his team went, whole churches were established. Boom, 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 boom. And pretty soon, there was a huge conflict going on because the Roman Empire did not like these fanatics. And so they started changing the Christians. Well, first of all, the Jews did it because they didn't like the fanatics, right? Those Christ followers. But then the Roman Empire got out on them as well. You know the story. Nero burning down Rome, using the Christians as torches. You know that most, well, all of the apostles except John died a martyr's death for their faith. Because they had a purpose every day that they lived. They lived with purpose. They were driven by Christ. They were driven by this salvation that they had obtained, this relationship with God that they had obtained. And I would love to come back sometime to talk more about religion and relationship or how do we go about being witnesses because it's not easy in today's world. It isn't. So, where we were, uh, work, sports, with a family, among people, what is important for us? And this is the thing that we need to hold on to. What is it that is really important to us? Well, our relationship to, to our Lord and Savior, to Jesus Christ, to God, our Father in heaven, is important, isn't it? Without that relationship, forget it, guys. Then it's just empty religion. And I don't like empty religion. It doesn't give us anything. It just makes us angry. All right, remain in me, Jesus says, and I will remain in you. That's not too hard, is it? should be pretty easy. Just talk to him. As you go, as you're on your bicycle, be careful when you drive your car, you know. Still pay attention to the traffic, please. Oh, that goes for the bikers too. Our mindset, where is it? Jesus said that we need to be wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. That means that we need to think, we need to plan, we need to do things, we need to be specific about what we want to do and what goal we want to reach. Here we go. Carrying through. This is the huge weakness in the Christian church today. We are not good at carrying through. You know, we, we have good ideas. We have visions every now and then. Oh, but it gets tiresome in the long run. Look at what Paul said to the Galatians. The Galatian church had run into problems with, with uh, wanting to follow the old law and all of this stuff, you know, getting into legalism again. And Paul said, do not grow weary in doing good. In other words, do not become tired doing whatever is right for you to do. 
keep on going. Carry through with it. Reach your goal. Here's some more. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Yes, of course, you, you know, without the Spirit of God, where would we be? God, in His love for us, poured out His Spirit on us so that we might follow the direction of the Holy Spirit. Imagine if the Spirit had not spoken to Philip. Go follow that road. We know what came out of it, don't we? The church was established in Ethiopia. Because this eunuch was sitting in his car reading the stuff, you know. He was basically a believer in some of the Jewish things. But then Philip, you know, do you understand what you're reading? How can I when no one explains it to me? And Philip then explains the gospel very simply. And, and whenever they came to some, uh, you know, a pond of water, a little lake, or whatever it was, the eunuch asked him, so is, is there a problem in me being baptized now? No, let's do it. Woof, you know. And that eunuch probably went back as the first Christian believer to the country of Ethiopia. And we know that the church was well established a couple of hundred years later in that country. Wow, one person listening to the Spirit. Come on, move. <laughs> oh, I, oh, sorry, I did move it. Okay, then John. Oh, sorry, one, one more step up. Joshua. Be strong and courageous. You know, it can be fearsome when we have to start sharing our faith and, you know, hey, I'm a Christian. Oh, ha, 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 you fool. You walk on crutches too? You know, don't worry. Be strong and courageous. And then always remember love. Look at what John says in, in his first letter. Whoever does not love does not know God. Always love as a motive. Always, always, always. Love on people. Show them that they have value. Show them that you want relationship with them. Amen. All right? That does not mean that you're going to win them to Christ the first year, the first two years. We, we don't know. But love on them anyways, because that's what we've been called to do. Oops, I'm moving the wrong way here, sorry. Um, so in conclusion, here we go, almost. Boom, 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 come on, move it. In conclusion, which way do you choose? Remember the picture with the hens without heads running to and fro and everywhere? The way of the aimless believer, is that what we choose? Who has? Come on, I'm almost done. So bear with me and bear with this sweet little thing here. There we go. Oh, they all came at one go. So the way of the aimless believer who has no sense of direction, no goals, no accomplishments, and no purpose. Do we want to be Christians like that? Come on, guys. Do I hear a yes? No. no. Good job. Good job. That's, that's how I like it. That's really how I like it. Rather, we want to be living a life in which our relationship with the Lord gives us a sense of purpose so that we work on our calling to love on people, right? And that in turn gives us a direction in life. And that makes our goal of reaching our heavenly destiny so much closer and so much easier. So folks, if you feel like it is time to make a decision, to change a few things, change a few patterns. My encouragement to you, to you is go ahead and do it. You cannot change everything at one go. Don't even try to do it. Change little by little. I have tried to push in a lot of new things and I'm not very good and, and systematic and I know how difficult it is. It is difficult. Take one little thing and say, okay, Lord, help me change this area in my life. This one area. And little by little, day by day, we can build a life where we become more excited about our faith. We want to share it with the people around us. Or do we? We want to share the... the I mean, 
I have the greatest gift in me that anyone could ever receive. Do I want to share it or not? If I don't want to share it, do I really appreciate the gift? So, little by little, we can change. Little by little, with the Lord's help, we can grow into the persons that we have been called to be. Hi again. I hope you were blessed by what you have just watched. Now, our vision is to help you to get in touch with God, others, and your destiny. In case you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is a time and an opportunity for you to pray a simple prayer to receive Him into your heart. All you need to do is to say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me on the cross. Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, help me to live a life as a true believer. Amen. That was a simple prayer, but if you believed in that prayer and you repeated it and received Jesus into your heart, you're born again. And we really want to keep in touch with you and ask you to continue to watch some of these teachings so that you can grow in your spiritual life. Now, if you'd like to be a part of this ministry, you can support us in three different ways. One of the ways is you can support us by praying. We'd really appreciate that. Pray for us. We covered the prayers of saints all around the world. Second, you can also do it by passing this link to somebody that you know. You know, somebody can be blessed and hopefully be connected to God just like you. Last but not least, you can also support us financially. There is a link in your screen where you can go to our homepage and figure out how you can either be a one-time or an ongoing donor to this ministry so we can spread the good news far and wide. Look, whether this is the first time I'm going to see you or you may come back to see us again, I just want to pray that God bless you and I hope that you'll have a wonderful day. Thank you and stay in touch. See you, bye.